All righty. Does everyone see my screen okay there? Looking good. Good to go, Houston. Perfect. Well, great. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, it's great to do this uh, finally. Um, it's, I'm always on the accelerator, but I'm often too busy working away over here and not able to actually kind of chat and join. So I'm more of a listening in, but this is a great opportunity to really sort of touch base. So uh, I'm a little fear, fearful that I've got way too many slides. So I'm going to try and whiz through. Um, I'm going to try and avoid talking about the architecture as much as that kills me. So I'm going to try and hop over that and maybe we'll touch on that some more, go back to it in the uh, the after hour. But uh, I'll try and get through the basics of the building and then get into the nitty gritty uh, as quick as I can. All right. Okay, so just a quick rundown of our project team here. Um, Project's been uh, developers Dimex Group. Uh, the main guys kind of involved really that we'll talk about on this presentation is Integral, the mechanical and electrical engineers. Um, and I'll just keep on going. Uh, so fundamentally, it's a 60 unit residential apartment and townhouse development in East Vancouver in BC. It's uh, fundamentally it's four buildings orientated around a central courtyard in a hybrid arrangement of four stacked, uh, four story stacked apartments at the front of the site and three story townhouses along the back. Uh, mixes of one, two and three bed suites uh, with two bed lock offs to the front building, uh, an FSR around about 1.58 of 57 and a half thousand square feet. Um, stacked apartments at the front of the more interesting building that's got uh, stacked units access from level one and two and then a walkway at level three to access the third and fourth floor um, and then a single level parkade is underneath that which has a well mechanical electrical and bike parking in <clears throat> the zone itself is rm12 but this is the hybrid form which is 12n uh, which allows 1.45 to about 1.7 fsr um, and in this case apartments and townhouses uh, up to three and four stories um, there were City of Vancouver um, incentives for this, like the 5% density bonus. Um, although that's a little confused on this project because of the hybrid zone. Um, and of course, the City of Vancouver also has the wall thickness exclusion allowance for those thicker walls. Uh, so fundamentally, it's broken down into building 1A and 1B, which I'll refer to more often as building one. Building two in, in the southwest corner, there, which is a three-story unit. And building three and four, again, more three-story townhouses along the back view of it there from the front of the building one along the front there. Um, the central courtyard is really aimed at being the primary route to really get people to interact and access most of the units uh, with access off East First and off Templeton Drive at the other end. Uh, and there's some common gathering spaces as well to try and add to that kind of community feel. Um, there is a level one, building one across the front and two and three, four along the back. Uh, building one really, the um, it challenged those design uh, expectations by doing this four-story apartment format with 40 units um, with level one and two access from grade and level three and four access from a common walkway and elevator um, up on uh, level three. Um, they're compact and, official, um, and efficient units. Um, uh, the mixtures of the two and three beds predominantly for this unit um, with the level one units offering uh, lock-off units as like a mortgage helper. Um, the fourth story that we'll get up to in a second, that's you can see the format of the Two levels there, the walkway, and then the fourth floor above. There's level two. Level three, that's the walkway with the elevator, which serves level three and four above. And there's level four. Um, that's accessed primarily by this elevator in the middle, which splits the building into two. And the stair behind that access from the courtyard gives you the stair, the stepped access as well. Um, the building was broken into two blocks, predominantly because of the um, limitations on building frontage under the zoning. Um, then we had to provide uh, exit stairs for the limitations of exiting, um, which separates kind of the building from being fundamentally two buildings to having these two end detached units as well. Um, the nice thing about this building using on East First is also the fact that it's uh, you get double aspect looking, but all the units run front to back. Um, and also acts as a nice sound barrier to separate from the busy First Avenue to the courtyard and the other townhouses behind. That's just a little view there of how those units look from the, the back. So they really they kind of uh, have that kind of apartment feel with the balconies. And there's the stairs separating those detached units on the end. And there's a couple of elevations from the, from the front and the back. And then from the two sides there. It's got a little, oh, there we go, a little pause. Um, so there's a little block there of those levels one and two. You can see how you've got the stepped access um, from the courtyards at level one for the level one units and the level twos step up from East First Avenue in the front and are stacked. Uh, and the level three units access from those stairs separating the units. And again, then stacking up 
to level four. The section there helps explain kind of really how those units come together. And those are the circulations, the stairs and the elevators. And then the long section coming through. Alrighty, building two, um, this is a more conventional um, uh, one level apartment, uh, one bed apartments at the ground floor, uh, and then three three story uh, townhouses uh, above, and another, again, another stacked arrangement. Um, you can see there in the section. Um, we did originally have, um, uh, we had a full third story, um, but unfortunately, because of some slightly strange City of Vancouver DCL waiver policies that cap your FSR 1.5 under medium density. It basically meant that because we were above 1.5, it meant we was going to basically cost a fortune. <laughs> so the we basically had no choice other than to make the make the project still financially viable. So it was actually cut area out the building, which meant for this guy, it meant taking off the third floor and turning it into this roof, kind of large roof area that you can see on the right hand side there with just a stair access up. Again, kind of messed up a building envelope from a passive house point of view. Massive view of it there. Um, Building three and four, which runs along the back of the site, more conventional three-story um, townhouses, three-bed units. That's all view of them from the rear. And that's the upper level. And we have this kind of uh, separated in the middle again because of this requirement for the frontage limitations. Um, then we've got this slightly odd unit that's in yellow there, which is the unit that goes above the, the parquet ramp. And then those are the master suites on the top floor, which make these nice nice roof decks. Um, unfortunately, you know, ideally, we'd like to have those to be a more conventional square shape. Um, but again, we've got limited by this 60% rule of the fact that the, the third floor needs to be 60% of the, uh, the, the, the floor below. And there it is in section just to help kind of understand that. And then they've got kind of these nice entries kind of with the uh, landscaping around them off the courtyard. Okay, so the nitty gritty, the passive house side stuff. Okay, um, ventilation. Um, so we looked at the uh, cent uh, centralized HIV setups. Um, typically, uh, it's good for central control and good for a central point of maintenance. And you have that high ventilation rates that give you lots of capacity. Um, problem is it's really better suited to uh, multifamily apartments and large, larger scale projects. Um, and also rental, because you need those common areas to be able to access those uh, common shared um, uh, systems. Um, Semi-central, very similar. It could have been an opportunity to do it maybe on the front building for building one because of the way it's stacked. Um, but under the cons, it's really, it was really quite a challenge to find a common shaft that would run through from level one through to four um, and not kind of basically mess up your floor plan. Uh, we ended up settling on having individual HIVs. So um, they're better suited to individual ownership um, they're well suited to townhouses as a general kind of form. Um, we're able to size each HRV to each unit. Um, the owners will then be able to control the, uh, any boosting or bypass to try and get that night flush. Um, the, most of the HRVs are located in either washrooms or storage rooms up in the ceiling if we can. Um, and the exterior ducting can be short by having individual HRVs um, and, and they have to be maintained by the owners. Uh, the strategy works out to be um, we have one bed units using the Zender CA 200s uh, and the bigger units, the two and three beds use the CA 350s, um, again, stored in the washrooms or the storeroom ceilings. Um, the hard ducting to the exterior uh, uses four inches of insulation, um, and then we use the three inch ComfoFlex pipes to distribute um, within the suites within drop ceilings. Um, the, we do have a bit of a typical challenge of trying to get that separation between the of ideally eight to 10 feet. Um, but we do question kind of how that really works when fundamentally it's your, it's the air from your own suite. So is that really contamination? That's certainly a discussion where we often have. Um, and then we are always typically hitting that challenge of trying to hit those PHI ventilation rates, but also getting it to work from an ASHRAE point of view. Um, the heating and cooling options. Um, we looked at um, these combined units, which you guys have seen a lot on here, um, particularly the Minotaur as their uh, sponsors. Um, great units, compact all in one, very easy installs, um, on demand heating and cooling. Um, nice things you don't need any outdoor condensers, um, and you can have efficient short refrigeration runs. Um, the, we did have issues with modeling, um, particularly with the Innova units. We like the look of those, but trying to get data out of Italy seems to be very difficult, um, and trying to get the city to the IPHPP and understand how we're modeling it and the certification issues with that. Um, and from a client point of view, they understand that it's not really full AC and they have concerns about whether it's just tempering cooling and not 
um, uh, not enough cooling. Um, but in a passive house, you know, that's, that's a debatable thing. And also just the unfamiliarity because they haven't been in the market that long. Um, the other options also very, um, and in this case, could, could have been in-stream heating and cooling. Um, again, very efficient because the heat pump's running it. Um, it's almost full AC, uh, depending on kind of what kind of tonnage you can deliver. Um, uh, single cores for whole projects or the whole unit. Um, the scale is again slightly better suited to um, to apartment buildings uh, rather than individual townhouses, but depending on the setup you choose. Um, again, no individual control if it is a central one, um, and needing those common service spaces um, and the potential issue of having refrigerants and the type of refrigerant that it is and the global warming potential of those. Um, shading. Um, we did look initially at uh, automated. Um, automated blinds. Uh, we have some quite big build, uh, windows on this and at the time they were designed with the intent of having exterior blinds but um, they're great because they are low energy use. Can we have them being automated or uh, manually controlled? Um, but they were looking a little bit expensive at the time of design um, and the detailing of how you prevent the thermal bridging. Um, we ended up settling and providing some breeze soleil on the south side of the building. You can see in the image there on the right hand side just to shade the bedrooms on the second floor of the back of the building. Um, nice and simple, um, could say dumb in many respects, because they don't give you a lot of control over that solar heat gate. Um, the cooling option we settled on was actually AC roughing with baseboard heaters. So um, we're mounting, we're putting curbs on the roofs um, and the, the service of the power and everything is gonna be roughed in uh, at construction. And the purchasers are gonna have the opportunity to put in one, two or three heads in the bedrooms and the living spaces um, at the time of purchase or because it's being plumbed in, you can have, you can install those later yourself. Um, the baseboard heaters then in the bedrooms and the living rooms. Um, Unfortunately, there's no smart control between these systems because the fact that we might, they might install them or they not, might not install them. Um, so there is a bit of user education we'll try and provide to the, uh, to the homeowners so that you don't just overlap and have the heating being churned out on the baseboard and having the cooling coming out of the AC. Uh, you do get the overheating prevention with the AC um, and you have the uh, manual auto control. Um, again, there is some cost, but it, that's from the client's point of view, this worked out to be the most cost effective option for this project. Um, okay, so the nitty gritty of how we actually plan these out. So um, this is an example of building one, which is the, the stacked, um, stacked apartments, um, showing the level one two bed with the lock off suite. On the right hand side there, you can see the slight blow up of it. Um, so these units type to have the HRVs in the washrooms. Um, the silence is located just outside the washroom in the corridor in a drop ceiling. Um, and we use the Comfort Flex pipes to distribute from the, um, uh, from the silence boxes to the rest of the suite. Uh, the adding complication for this is because of the lock-off suite, um, we have to run tin ducting uh, from, the, from the silencer unit into that suite uh, because we have to have a fire damper on it. And there's all sorts of code issues about do you or don't you need a smoke damper, but that's kind of more specific to, to Vancouver than sort of the wider field. Um, example of a, a level two three-bed unit, um, and the bigger one using the, the, uh, the, three, the CA350, um, again, similar, similar layout. The reason I've shown the one on the right hand side is because although the units are, the layouts are very similar, obviously when it's, uh, when it's, uh, set, when it's a unit in the middle of a, like a row house set up like the one on the right hand side, you've got to have a slightly different um, exterior run for the, for the ducts. And as you can see there in the bedroom, we've got the um, supply running down one side of the bedroom, the exhaust running down the other. So we've got slightly um, fussy drop ceilings going on, but it was a number of back and forths trying to figure out the best way to run those. Uh, another example of a, um, the level four. So the, the level four is slightly different because it's a one bed suite. Um, so it's using the smaller CA200s. Um, again, we've got the, uh, in this location, the ERVs are located really close to the exterior walls. So they've got nice efficient runs. Um, and again, the Comfort Flex type um, ducting running around the rest of the suite. Uh, the, these are the, the level one uh, units for the one beds in the, in the townhouses, uh, sorry, in the, the apartments on building two, and also the three-story townhouse uh, to the right hand side there. Um, uh, exactly the same setup. Again, you've got the HRV in the closet in this instance, in the bedroom, um, with a short run to the outside. Um, and then in the townhouse using the uh, two by four, there's a bit of debate still about whether you can fit Comfort Flex pipes in a two by four wall. Some people told me yes, some people tell me you need two by six, bit of a debate. Uh, we'll see as this one moves forward. And these are just some of the other ones as well. Again, you can see how those runs uh, run around the ceiling in the drop and then go down a, uh, down a wall. So the HRV is located in the middle floor, so then they distribute up and down to be the shortest possible runs.
Uh, moving on to domestic hot water, um, uh, the we looked at the option of having a central system, but the, there wasn't really, again, any central kind of common space we could do it, and we were limited for space in the parkade. And um, there were some cost implications as well, and the length of the research lines for that system. And certainly, gas is not an option for this project, electric only. Um, so the choice of the sand and heat pumps, um, very very efficient COP, a three and a half, three, three and a half to four. Um, we've got four mechanical rooms in the parkade. Um, we're typically grouping them together and we've got gives us flexibility as to where they can go in the parkade um, and very easy maintenance and because in the parkade less risk of freezing um, and we can position them uh, conveniently so we've kind of positioned them around the parkade so they're closer to the specific buildings and they basically feed each um, each building is fed by their local mechanical room uh, so in blue there is where kind of the heat pumps are located on the walls uh, here's the schematic of the uh, domestic hot water. I don't know if Scott wants to jump in here as I've been ranting away. He, he loves the hot water. So. <laughs> uh, anybody who, uh, we're, we're big fans of the sand and heat pumps for domestic hot water. And we're using them even in non pacifos projects. And Vancouver has basically just legislated that we are no longer allowed to use um, gas for domestic hot water. And the single family houses are not gonna be able to use gas either. So. Uh, Vancouver is moving along pretty fast. Uh, and what we're finding is these sand and heat pumps. I saw a little article on Twitter today that actually showed in most Canadian cities, heat pumps are going to be cheaper than gas at today's gas prices. So that was really interesting. Um, so if anybody doesn't know how this system works, basically you, you're, where, you're at the far end, there's a tank, which is the coldest of the tanks. That's where the incoming water supply will come from the city, uh, cold water, um, that's ST11 there. And what happens is the sand and heat pump will take the water out of the bottom of that tank, which is the coldest place in the tank, run it through the heat pump, and then it'll deposit in the top of the farthest tank. And what happens then is that farthest tank then uh, goes as there's a demand in the system it'll move that water into the final tank which is ewh4 which is an electric hot water tank and that tank is there has got electric resistance it's not a and the purpose of the electric resistance is just to make up the little bit of losses that you get in the domestic hot water as it recirculates around the building so in the morning it's not going to matter because what's going to happen is that that sand and tank is going to deliver about 150 degree water into the top of that electric hot water tank. And we're gonna set that temperature of that electric hot water tank at about a 130 degrees. So what happens is as the water leaves that, it's gonna leave that somewhere. Well, this, this says 145 degrees. Uh, it's gonna go into that mixing valve, which will mix it down to about 140 degrees. Then it'll circulate around the building. It'll come back at, if it comes back at less than 130 degrees and there's no demand putting 140 degree water, or 150 degree water in the top of the tank, then that electric water heater will just kick on just to make up maybe five, 10 degrees in that water temperature, just to bring it back up to 130. Uh, that's usually how they're set up. Now this says 140, but something like that. Anyway, that's the way the system will work. And we found that that's the best way to, to do the makeup uh, from the hot water system on the research. Anyways, thanks. See, told you, he loves the stuff. Right. You've now eaten up all my time. So now I've got to it. All righty. Um, we also have air admittance valves on this project. It um, uh, was a big issue for us in the very first early days when we first started doing passive house on multifamilies. Um, great for eliminating thermal bridges through the through the roof. Um, very, very reliable. We're using them in cold climates up in Smithers as well as uh, locally in the lower mainland. Uh, and they are basically plumbed just the same as a standard vented system, but um, you have an AAV on uh, on groups. And as you can see, there's um, uh, four, you four all feeding into to one vent. Um, now onto the envelope. Um, so to pass about, so it's high performance assemblies. Uh, we've got around about R45 for the typical wall assembly, R62 for the roof. R48 for the floor to the parkade, R4 again for R48 where it's um, to the ground plane. Um, there are some thermal bridges, but again, those are accounted for in PHPP. Uh, the exterior wall itself is typically a six inch uh, EFIS um, system on a two by six wall. Um, the particular finish we're having actually is uh, at the moment, it's kind of still out of tender at the moment, but it's um, at the moment it's spec as this ADEX RS um, or XNC system, which is six inches of insulation, either EPS or rock wall, uh, sorry, rock wall, uh, depending on kind of which uh, what code requirements you have for um, 
uh, spatial separation and, and combustibility. Um, it's spatially efficient, uh, it's cost effective, uh, nice simple air barrier on the face of the plywood. Um, it's a relatively fam uh, familiar construction method locally here. Um, and again, it's flexible from a material point of view in terms of if you do change out that exterior finishing product, uh, you can use a different kind of air barrier, whether it's going to be a liquid applied or a membrane on the face of that plywood. Um, I see the this is just a diagram that we've put together for to indicate where our air barrier is in planning section there that's typical building one. Uh, this is the example of the ADEX system itself Here's one of our typical um, uh, through all flashing details. Um, you can see that we've still got a little bit of um, spray foam where it's needed. Um, uh, just going to prevent that thermal bridging really kind of cap it off. Um, and we do, we'll have standard flashing is kind of breaking through where, the, where each floor is. Uh, typical interior and ex sorry, external inter internal corners. Um, now, on this project, we've got a few steps kind of occurring where we've got things like the parkade ramp. Um, so in this instance, in the parkade, we've got uh, around about five inches of mon sprayed monoglass on the underside, and we've gone for a split insulation system. So then we have um, uh, between four and six inches of insulation on top of the slab. Um, at the moment, we're specking that as EPS, but on some of our projects lately, actually the contractors have preferred using, um, admittedly this was in a commercial setup, they actually preferred to use um, spray foam uh, and then using a leveling screed on top to make it uh, for a smooth finish. Uh, typical soffit detail there. Um, again, the advantage of using this um, uh, stucco ADEX system is that uh, it's then one trade for the entire project. You know, on other projects, typically we can, if you want a, a pattern or you want a solid color, you can use Hardy. Um, but with the ADEX system, I should really put a diagram in, but basically you can, you can provide stencils with it so you can give it a pattern. Um, on some of those 3D images, you might have seen some of the um, basics or pattern lines forming. And again, that's just from a stencil that they actually pour on, do, the, do one scratch coat, peel it off and then do a finishing coat. Um, so that's one system to run in all conditions where the horizontal or vertical. Um, so it gives you lots of flexibility in one trade. So it's nice and efficient. Um, what is some of our typical deck details? Uh, in these instances, you can see where we've got the, uh, it's pretty good for thermally isolating um, our, uh, our, our connections to things like uh, privacy screens. Uh, we typically have this little upstand just to provide that six inches kind of protection from uh, from where the water's landing and spraying up the wall. Um, and we've actually elected to basically provide a metal cap that will cover that. So it means it kind of uh, try and protect that EPS from kind of getting dented in the stucco, again, not from getting scratched and kind of chipped off. Uh, typical um, deck detail, as you can see, in some cases, we do have to um, step the ceiling down. Um, we'll use thinner framing. Um, so we've typically got 11 by 7 eighths in the floor, and then we'll go to 2 by 8 or something like that at the decks just to make up that extra insulation. And as you see, it's a little tricky with how you can get your, um, your air barrier in, so you've really got to look at these details um, and figure out how, like, where you're pre-stripping and where you're building wood curbs and things like that. Um, typical deck in this particular situation, uh, this is where we've got the walkway. Uh, they really didn't want to drop the ceiling in the bedrooms below, so we've got some alternative framing going on. Um, and a little bit of a thermal... Um, bridge or basically just a little kind of zone of a slightly less uh, R value, which again is kind of accounted for in the model. Uh, typical roof detail there. Uh, now onto the windows. Um, certainly we're looking at Inertech, Euroline, Castadia, and there's actually a new window coming from Starline, uh, which is using a, I believe it's a, um, a Shuko uh, profile. And they're who we're looking at and working with on the tendering at the moment and part of some value engineering. Um, for a medium, looking for a medium to low solar heat gain coefficient, again, trying to tackle that constant problem in Vancouver now of new passive houses of the overheating. Um, Multi-point locking um, and the key thing about how you locate that hardware to make sure you don't get any flex and bowing in the frames. Um, locally available windows, very important. Um, these ones in particular are now being made in the lower mainland, uh, the Starline ones that is, same as Euroline. Um, trying to limit the number of windows, like different sizes down to a minimum, try and keep, keep the cost down. Um, and again, using the different sizes in kind of the right locations, really trying to maximize both the views from living spaces, providing you know, a bit of privacy to the bedrooms, but a little bit of um, solar orientation for that. But most of that organization is driven by the site zoning, the client's unit count requirement. Um, whereas on single family, you get the opportunity to really uh, control the window locations based more on site and orientation. Um, the windows will be tilt and turn. 
uh, and again, using windows for the patio doors rather than using uh, entry doors. Um, trying to get flush thermally broken sills for the doors as a challenge. So uh, certainly looking at a couple of different options for that. Uh, and we're using interior blinds to uh, give you both privacy control and a little bit of solar control as well. Uh, so it's the standard um, sill detail for, I think at the moment, this is detailed with the, uh, the Euroline frame, I think. <clears throat> Uh, and then a typical head detail on the side there with the blind box. And depending on the framing, you can either drop your, you know, either lift your blind box up into between the joists. Um, and the issue always being, you just want to make sure that your window can tilt back without it hitting that blind. Um, for the entry doors, this is detailed at the moment with the cowl door. Um, a great door, beautiful looking, pretty heavy, difficult, slightly difficult to get the clear opening because um, it is a big frame. Um, but again, we're now looking potentially at Starline for a, a, a modified version of their um, window frame to be used as a door. Uh, certification and air tightness testing. Um, this is just an example of one of our buildings, uh, one of the buildings on the site. I think this is the, um, yeah, the, uh, the detached unit on building one. So basically the worst case scenario one. <clears throat> for this project, as frustrating as it is for us, we do need to provide seven PHPPs because those are detached. They need to be counted as a separate buildings. Um, so we described it as four buildings, but really from PHPP, it's seven. Uh, we think it should be basically done as one whole project, but that's up for debate and for another, another, another meeting. Um, and so uh, really by looking at the challenges of this detached unit, um, it's we would slightly struggle on this one because it's the same fundamental plan mostly as the other as the other units adjacent to it, but it's got more exterior walls. So it's just not quite as efficient from a um, wall to volume area ratio. Um, mid air construction, uh, mid construction air testing. Um, the challenge is when do you do it? Um, speak with the contractor, figure out the schedule and the practicality of when you can do remediations. Um, again, we're going to test building uh, 1A and B on those detached units because they're the worst case scenarios with the most kind of steps and jogs and junctions. Uh, so we can learn the lessons from those buildings, uh, from that one building, and then apply it uh, to the others as we go through. Um, these are some diagrams that we put together for the passive house verification plan for the city of Vancouver, but they're also very useful just from a practical point of view for planning the project. You can kind of see how the, it indicates where the air barrier is, where the sweet to sweet air barrier is, and then where those openings are going to be formed. Uh, so the challenge with the townhouses is how do you connect them together because you've got to do it as a single building so you've got to find a location um, ideally somewhere where you can easily remediate the drywall or basically leave the drywall out and fill it in easily later so using things like storerooms um, and closets um, and of course it can happen in 3d as well because it's when you've got three stories stacked alongside each other with different layouts um, the basically the openings to link the buildings together can kind of do this quite a few plans involved for <laughs> mapping this out with them. Um, so in section, this is just like a quick diagram to indicate kind of where the blow blower door is going. Um, for the building one there, you can see on the top left corner, we're actually going to blow door test the top units and then the bottom units and they'll pressurize against each other. Um, and you can see those kind of blue squares indicating where those horizontal openings are going to be made between the suites. Um, obviously, 0.6 is the target, but you know, ideally, we'd like to try and hit something around 0.4. That's generally what we're seeing on most of our projects. Um, you want to make sure you're going to you're going to gang all those electrical penetrations together where you can through your envelope. Um, prep as many of your uh, penetrations as you can. Um, gasketing and tape sealing all your ducts um, for your air barrier. Uh, make mock-ups at difficult junctions if you can. Um, the adjustment of doors and windows is always seems to be a problem these days. Um, capping your HRVs. Um, uh, I just want to chuck this one in because Scott actually mentioned it a while ago and it seemed like quite a good idea. He thought about rather than creating those openings between the suites and having to make up the walls later, um, he thought the idea of potentially daisy chaining the HRVs together rather than capping them off so using a flexible piping to link one unit to the other as it goes, goes along. We probably won't do that, but it was an interesting one to explore. Um, other design features on the project, um, recirculation hood fans, uh, indu induction cooktops, uh, heat pump washer dryers, um, we've got load management uh, services applied to the electrical car charging because it's pretty extensive now. Um, we do have an electrical vault in lieu of a PMT. Um, the exterior elevator, uh, again, purely for access, but also useful because it's outside the thermal envelope, so it's simpler. Um, LED lighting, as you probably would in any project, but you know, worth noting. Um, 
and just some additional bike facilities and other uh, kind of social amenities that have been provided. Um, some lessons and things we'd like to kind of learn and challenges we dealt with. Um, the lock-off suites for this one in particular, um, acoustic and code issues generally related to separating lock-off suites from the rest of the suites. Um, can you even get doors that are STC 50 and 45 minute rated with closers? It's difficult. Um, and the whole kind of shared ventilation between the suites and if you need smoke dampers. Um, just the challenge of having stacked units, um, having cold spaces over heated spaces below and trying to create th uh, flush thresholds between them. Um, having a variety of different suites, as you've seen from all the different plans, it's kind of four completely different buildings all in one project. So it's just a lot of complexity. Um, and again, that creates lots of different ventilation uh, plan layouts as well to try and get your head around. Um, municipal challenges, of which there were quite a few. Um, it's perhaps a little over the top, but certainly we're trying to like trying to work with the municipalities to really focus on the important stuff and not the kind of small inconsequential issues. Um, for example, we ended up having, having to have a meeting to discuss one eighth of an inch of heights that were out over the envelope. And I mean, it does. I won't go on. Um, uh, the things about stepping, having to have this sixty percent rule at the fourth story, just means it makes your envelope very inefficient. Um, Again, the problem we had with the um, the DCL waiver and the the the, uh, the caps on it, and how it ended up cutting the building down and just really um, affecting the project really negatively. Um, the box storage rules in the city of Vancouver are a challenge, but that's not passive house, so I won't bore you with it. Um, same with accessibility, more VBL related, but again, challenges just trying to make suites efficient. Um, parking requirements still too high in our opinion, just always a problem. Um, the wall station exclusion policy, it's great, but we'd love to see it simplifies because it's we just spend a lot of time having to do the calculations on it and it's just too complicated. Really, it's just measure to the inside face of drywall, just a little bugbear. Um, this, the separation of the exhaust and the supplies comes up on every project. One consultant's happy having them together with the um, with louvers facing the opposite directions. Uh, others say, no, it's got to be the eight to 10 feet. So it's a kind of an ongoing battle. Um, the passive house criteria that we're struggling with a little bit as always, Great targets, but sometimes we just find some of the trying to hit those targets is a little detrimental to best practice from, an, from a construction and architectural point of view. Um, trying to compromise certain things to make sure we hit the 15 is always a little bit difficult. Um, refrigerants, using systems to try and achieve these high efficiency levels are great, but again, the risk of those, the global warming potential risk of those leaking. Um, the extent of thermal bridges, Sometimes when you've got a building that's big enough, do you really need to account for everyone? If you've got a headroom in your model, then you can probably, you know, you should be able to get, get away with it. Um, and again, the accuracy of trying to put the sheer amount of information in the PHPP is a challenge. And then looking at it as a whole and thinking, how much does this really impact the whole um, performance of the model? Um, lessons that we take forward, uh, etarting strategies, doing diagrams at an earlier stage for, for everyone to understand what you have to do um, and discussing it with the trades and the site supers. Um, ventilation and cooling, we typically do the diagrams ourselves now of just mapping out where we want to run the ducts, what sizing units will do. We'll typically do the flow rates, do a markup and then send it to our consultants. Um, always having headroom in the PHPP, be conservative in the early days. Uh, then when you get value engineering ch challenges later, uh, it just gives you headroom to still make it work. Um, overheating prevention, window sizes, shading strategies. We model them in-house, but just trying to accommodate those at an early stage is helpful. Um, we're looking forward to the future benefits of PHPP 10. I haven't had a chance to delve into it yet, but we gather there's some good things in the pipeline and that should help us. Um, value engineering, again, trying to deal with cost savings in this era of hyperinflation uh, and balancing that and getting your client to understand the fact you've gone passive house and you've gained 5% bonus in Vancouver. So trying to make sure those numbers still add up. Um, always simplify your building form, of course, we all know that here, but it's not always within our power to do it. The city defines most of that in the zoning. Um, and for us, certainly looking to use BIM more in the future and just improve that efficiency of using SketchUp like you saw in those images and 2D vector works. Um, and just a token gesture back to the city of Vancouver to say, we do have some challenges with the DP process, but we have had really, really great support by uh, from the um, green building and energy department really to solve lots of those issues and really break down barriers and really just help us achieve the buildings and make them kind of perform the way we think they should be done. A uh, couple, quick couple of images of our uh, other project. This is my other project, Lakewood Townhouse, with the same developer that's actually just across the street. They're both being designed and built at the same time. Um, this is Rupert, I believe. This is one we had the walkthrough of just last week, which is under construction. 
Um, this is another townhouse development of mine, which has just gone on hold because of the new uh, Broadway plan. It's probably going to be replaced with a 20 story tower, but again, a um, complicated stat, but uh, quite a nice townhouse development. Um, and then another one in the office that I'm working on, which is this uh, 7 to 80 Fraser Street, uh, which is a 100 unit rental um, plus 12 townhouses um, to their sort of a co development. Right. I think my throat is dry enough. I've probably gone on way too long. I've no idea what the time is, but thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.